Chapter 16 Displaced No Pashtun leaves his land of his own sweet will. Either he leaves from poverty or he leaves for love. So goes a famous Pashtun tapa, a couplet my grandmother taught me. Now we were going to be driven out by a force the writer could never have imagined, the Taliban. I stood on our roof looking at the mountains, at the valleys, where we used to play cricket, the apricot trees coming into bloom. I tried to memorise every detail in case I never saw my home again. Then I went downstairs and tried to pack. It was chaos. My brothers were pleading with my mother to take their pet chicks with them, and my cousin's wife was in the kitchen crying. When I saw her crying, I started crying too. My heart was full, but sometimes it's not until someone else cries that my tears feel free to flow. I ran into my room and tried to think about what I could take with me. I was travelling in Safina's family car, so there wasn't much room. The rest of my family was going in a car with my father's friend. I packed my school bag first with my books and papers. I took a last look at my trophies and said goodbye to them. Then I started stuffing my clothes into a bag. In my haste, I took, my, I took the pants from one set of shower kameez and the top from another, so I ended up with things that didn't match. When I closed the door to my room, for possibly the last time, and walked into the kitchen, I saw my mother telling Atto again that we couldn't take the chicks. What if they make a mess in the car, she tried. But Atto would not be swayed and suggested we buy them nappies to wear. Poor Atto. He was only five years old and already he known two wars in his short life. He was a child. The army and the Taliban were on a collision course with our home and all he cared about were his little birds. They couldn't go with us, of course, and when my mother said that they would have to stay behind with an extra ration of food and water, I told burst into tears. Then, when she said I would have to leave my school books behind, I nearly cried too. I loved school and all I cared about were my books. We were children after all, children with childish concerns, even with a war on the way. I hid my books in, our, in a bag in our guest room, where it seemed safest, and whispered some Quranic verses over the books to protect them. Then the whole family gathered together and said goodbye to our house. We said some prayers and put on our sweet home in God's protection. Outside the street, we were choked with traffic, cars and rickshaws, mule carts and trucks, all packed with people in their suitcases, bags of rice and bedrolls. There were motorbikes with entire families balanced on them, and other people running down the street with just clothes on their back. Few people knew where they were going, they just knew they had to leave. Two million people were fleeing their homes. It was the biggest exodus in Pashtun history. My mothers and brothers and I were going to stay with our family in Shandala. But our father said his duty was to go to Peshawar to warn people about what was going on. None of us liked this idea, especially my mother, but we understood. It was agreed that he would travel part of the way with us, then we would leave him in Peshawar. The trip, which usually took a few hours, took two days. First, we had to go out of our way because that's where Safina's family and father's friend were going, and we were travelling with them in our cars because we didn't have one. When we got to the town of Mardan, we went on by ourselves, taking the flying coach as far as it would go. By the end of our journey, we were on foot. We had to walk the last 15 miles on treacherous, washed out roads, carrying all our things. It was nearly dark and a curfew would go into effect any minute when we reached the turn off to Shangala. There, an army officer at a roadblock stopped us. Curfew! No one can pass through here, he said. We are IDPs, we told him. We need to get to our family's village. But he still would not let us pass. Internally displaced persons. That's what we were now. Not Pakistanis, not Pashtuns. Our identity had been reduced to three letters. I-D-P. We begged the man after my grandmother began to weep. He let us pass. As we walked those last few miles in the dark, shivers ran down our spine. We were worried then that an approaching army vehicle would mistake us for terrorists and shoot us in the back. Finally, when we were staggered into Shangala, our relatives were shocked. 
The Taliban had only recently left the mountains, but there was a rumour they would be back. Why did you come here? they asked. For IDPs, there was no safe place. We tried to settle into a new life in the mountains, not sure how long we'd be there. I signed up for some classes as my cousin Sambu, who was a year older than me, and then realised I would have to borrow clothes from her because I had packed a mishmash of trousers and tunics. It took us more than half an hour to walk to school, and when we arrived I saw that there were only three girls in Sambu's grade. Most of the village girls stopped going to school after they turned ten, so the few girls who did get taught were going alongside the boys. Meanwhile, I caused a bit of a shock because I didn't cover my face the way the other girls did and because I talked freely in class and asked questions. I was soon to learn a lesson in my in-country ways. It happened on the second day of school when Sumbul and I arrived late for class. It was my fault. I always liked to sleep in. And I started to explain. I was momentarily confused when the teacher told us to hold out our hands then stunned when he slapped my wrists and my cousin's palms with a stick. I went to my seat, burning with humiliation, but after my embarrassment faded, I realised this punishment meant I was simply being treated as one of the group. I was content being with my cousins, but oh how I missed my home, and my old school, and my books, and even ugly Betty. The radio was our lifeline up in the mountains, and we listened to it constantly. One day in May, the army announced that he had sent paratroopers into Mingora for, in preparation for a face-off with Taliban there. A battle raged for four days, up and down the streets of Mingora. It was impossible to tell who was winning, and by the end, there was no hand-to-hand combat in the streets. I tried to picture it. Taliban men fighting in the alley while we played cricket. Army soldiers shooting out of hold hail windows. Finally, the army announced that it had the Taliban on the run. It had destroyed Imam Deri, the Zula stronghold. Then it captured the airport. Within four weeks, the army said it had taken back the city. We breathed a little easier, but wondered. Where would the Taliban go in retreat? Would they come back up here, to the mountains? All this time, we worried terribly about my father, It was nearly impossible to get a phone signal way up in the mountains and sometimes my mother had to climb a big boulder in the middle of the field just to get one bar of service. So we almost never heard from him. He was in Peshawar, staying in a room at a hostel with three other men trying to get the media and the regional officials to understand what was going on in SWAT this whole time. Then, after about two more weeks, he called and told us to join him in Peshawar. We all wept with joy when we were finally reunited. He had big news. Richard Holbrook, a special ambassador for the United States, would be holding a meeting in Islamabad, and we were invited. But the morning of the meeting, we overslept. I hadn't set the alarm correctly, and my father was a bit angry at me. Somehow we made it to the hotel in time, though. It was a conference of 20 social activists from war-stricken tribal areas across Pakistan, all gathered around a large table, and I was seated right next to the ambassador. Mr Holbrook turned to look at me. How old are you? he said. I straightened my posture to look as tall as possible. I am 12, I said. It was almost true. I'd be 12 in a matter of days. I took a deep breath. Respected ambassador, I said. I request you help us girls to get an education. He laughed. You already have lots of problems and we're doing lots for you, he said. We have pledged billions of dollars in economic aid. We are working with your government on providing electricity and gas, but your country faces a lot of problems. I could not tell what his laughter meant, but I understood his words. The education of girls was far down on the list of issues that Pakistan faced. Maybe my posture sagged a little. Maybe my smile faded a bit, but I didn't really let on that I was disappointed. Besides, by now I knew, just to get on TV and speak on behalf of girls, education was half the battle. The other half still lay ahead of us, and I would keep fighting. After our visit to Islamabad, where we also held a press conference to share our story so that people would know what was happening in SWAT, we didn't quite know where we would go next. Mingora was still smouldering. 
the Taliban were retreating into the mountains as what. So we accepted an invitation to stay in Abbottabad. Better yet, the news was that Mon Eber was staying in Abbottabad. She and I hadn't spoken since our fight just before the last day of school, but she was still my best friend. So I called and invited her to meet in a park. I took Pepsi and biscuits as a peace offering. It was all your fault, she told me. I agreed. I didn't care who was right or wrong, although I'm pretty sure I had done nothing wrong. I was just happy being friends again. Meanwhile, my birthday was coming. All day I waited for the celebration, but in the chaos everyone had forgotten. I tried not to feel sorry for myself, but I couldn't help thinking about how different my birthday, my last birthday had been. I had shared cake with my friends, there had been balloons and I had made a wish for peace in our valley. I closed my eyes and made that same wish on my 12th birthday.